Welcome to this podcast on digital responsibility. There's a vibrant community across the world at the moment driving forward corporate digital responsibility, which includes a range of aspects from digital ethics, digital for the environment, sustainability, digital well-being, inclusion, accessibility and more. My name is Rob Price, one of the founders of Corporate Digital Responsibility back in 2017. If you'd like to know more, have a look at the website corporatedigitalresponsibility.net Welcome to the first uh, of season two of the Corporate Digital Responsibility podcast and I'm delighted to be joined by Daniel tonight and we're going to be talking about digital ethics. So Daniel, do you want to do an introduction of who you are and what you do? Yes, thank you, Rob. Uh, I do three things. I, um, for fun, uh, uh, have pa- for the past five years, been running a master's program in applied AI in UCL. So I have about 100 students every year going out there applying emerging technologies to solving a whole range of different uh, problems in industry. I, uh, the second thing I do is I do a huge amount of um, public engagement around uh, AI and the impact of AI on society at about 100 keynotes or board talks a year. And, and my day job is running a company called Satalia, which is about 100 people. And we build AI solutions for some of the biggest companies in the world. And you've obviously mastered the art of finding more than 24 hours in a day to juggle all of that as well. Yeah, I'd like to say I've got a digital twin of myself, but I'm not that lucky. (laughs) I think we all need one of those, actually. So if you can replicate that, then that'll be a a fantastic offer to the market. Um, We've talked in the past around um, the conversations that we see, certainly in the UK, but actually all over the world at the moment, around AI ethics. Um, And a lot of it tends to be specifically AI ethics, uh, rather than kind of some of the broader pieces that we've also touched on. Um, from your perspective, what's happening with that conversation in the market? And it does seem to have accelerated a lot in the last two years, especially. But what's what's your view? Yeah, I've reached, recently pivoted my my position on AI, AI ethics. Um, for, for, for some time, I was referring to myself as an, an AI ethicist until one of my good friends, um, Callum Chase, who is the author of um, the economic singularity, as well as among, amongst other books are related to AI. He, he really challenged me on the concept of, of AI uh, ethicists. And two things. One, I, th- I think there's a lot of confusion in, in industry, in the market about what these terms are. So AI ethics, AI safety. And then when you start to really scratch the surface, um, you, you realize actually there isn't a much beyond it. So, so maybe just to kind of clarify, AI safety is, is building systems that... Um, that, uh, that behave themselves, um, that, that function correctly. And the difference between more traditional software systems and AI systems is AI systems either are trained, which means that they're not engineered, they're not built, they're actually trained and taught, and that makes them prone to bias, and it makes them more complex. Um, the other kind of nuance when it comes to AI safety is that is that systems um, can adapt themselves. So they, they, could, they could behave in ways that we can't necessarily predict, which makes, uh, again, validating verifying them much more complicated um so 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 ai safety is about determining whether systems are are going to behave how we want them to behave whereas ai ethics is 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 really um uh, a subject about um intent Uh, are they going to behave in a way that we um intend and is that intent good or bad and the reason why i've changed my position on this recently is because there are already well established um software testing mechanisms that have been developed over decades uh, that need to be extended to uh, to take into account ai systems and and if you ask yourself honestly there are, there are already well established ai uh, sorry ethics frameworks that have been developed over decades that don't need to be differentiated from ai they need to be extended and enriched um, in, uh, with uh, with the nuances that ai brings so actually I, it's the, the skeptic in me thinks that now AI safety and AI ethics are being used as marketing buzzwords by tech firms to 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 get more clients. When when actually we should be thinking about extending, extending, expanding more traditional mechanisms to take into account AI. And I, and I think one of the things for me is that if I look at um, corporate boards 
with their existing ethics processes. Maybe there's an argument that says there needs to be more insight around certain aspects to it, a, a, a depth of understanding, if you like, about algorithms and how they can be utilized um, rather than maybe looking at things that they've done around modern slavery or, or, or other aspects to it. Um, but equally, I mean, um, blockchain, quantum, other things that have challenges, potentially challenges associated with them, do we have a separate kind of uh, set of activities around quantum ethics? Or I guess the argument is no matter what the technology is that creates a concern or, or, or impact beyond expected, they need to be wrapped up in the same piece. I think that's absolutely right. And um, uh, I think that the people out there that are, uh, are calling themselves AI ethicists, ethicists, me being one of them, should ask themselves, call themselves ethicists and see if that sits well with them. And I suspect for the most part, it, it, it doesn't. Uh, but, but I do think that the, these uh, technologies do mean that we have to look very carefully at these frameworks, safety frameworks and ethics frameworks and enrich them. Um, and, and so they, they do warrant a, a deeper discussion. I don't think it's a separate discussion, but they do warrant a, a deep discussion. There's another interesting piece there. I spent the last few years uh, as a technologist uh, saying the more I'd looked at this area, this area being corporate digital responsibility, digital, digital responsibility, et cetera, the more I found myself talking about economic models, but I'm not an economist. Um, but there is this convergence of um, economic principles with social responsibility, with technological change, with data responsibility. So we find ourselves needing to bring in that expertise from appropriate areas, which doesn't always necessarily sit within our own experience to date. Absolutely. I have a, I have a, a vision that one day I'll be hire, hiring historians that sit in my scrum teams. Uh, so I, I think that we, we at the moment, we, we, we construct our teams primarily from a technical perspective, uh, but there's no reason why those teams shouldn't be augmented with psychologists, philosophers, economists, um, uh, sci-fi writers to make sure what we're doing has a diversity of views, a diversity of opinions, and that what we're actually producing is going to end up being good or um, identify opportunities where it could be bad. So how, how practically do we bring that experience together then? Because um, I, on, on the podcast, I've had a series of conversations around some of this. Uh, Tony Fish, for example, and his example of the Australian Bank uh, Eth Digital Ethics Advisory Board. So we bring a range of people together with these kind of diverse skills and knowledge and a governance model that hooks into that expertise and experience and portrays it in a way that we expect businesses to then respond to, whether it's to do things differently or, or to at least have the justification that what they're planning to do is appropriate and permissible. Um, what are you seeing out there in terms, I mean, embryonic space, but what, what have you seen that's good out there and, and equally kind of what do we need to evolve? Yeah, I think, again, there are probably two things to look at here is we're using AI to, to actually try to improve diversity and inclusion. We're, we're saying that many of the models that we're building are biased because of the training data or maybe the intent that we've, we've misinterpreted. And so, so, we, we, so one of the th crazy things we used to do in my company was we used to get everybody to make public recommendations for their salary and then get everybody to vote on whether those salaries should be reduced or increased or kept the same. And we would use machine learning to determine how many votes one person has for another. So instead of having a manager or a group of people, small group of people determining your salary, we would try to decentralize that decision based on your proximity. So we would uh, try and identify people that are very knowledgeable about your domain that's, very, that's worked closely with you over the past year and, and, then, and then weight their decision around your salary based on that proximity. So, so, so you, you can use these technologies and tools to identify um, a diverse group of people to make a decision. And, and I think that works very well. But then you have to then empower those people with a framework to assess whether something is ethical or not and one of the things i'd like to do um is is build on uh the traditional um ethics structures and frameworks and actually use ai this might be a bit a bit, a bit bold but my my assumption my hypothesis is that uh, is that philosophies and ideologies religious or non-religious ideologies they 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 haven't 
um, aspects of them that we all potentially agree on. And, uh, and I want to use AI to analyze all of these different corpuses of texts, religious texts and, and whatnot, to see if there are any pillars that we agree on uh, as a species. So, you know, if we look at constitutions, freedom, um, liberty, equality, these are, these are words I, I think that most people um, uh, agree on. So could we use AI to extract those ethical pillars and, 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 and see if they are match our, our current ethical frameworks and then use that framework to make sure that when we're building systems that they are, they are um, they're in line with that framework. So we could use AI to bring people together, but we could also use AI to understand what the ethical framework is we should be measuring decisions against. And, and I think it's probably one of the answers to one of the other questions, which is um, where do we get all the people from to fulfill these roles across all of the world's corporate businesses? And, and the answer is probably, well, we either have to do a lot of training very quickly, or we have to find a way of automating some of that supplemented by people who can kind of help and direct. How do you think people would react to that in terms of if there was... Um, if, if the current compliance officers or, or, or people responsible for regulatory and, and, and ethical adherence were supplemented by some sort of technology or AI that kind of said, gave them the context. Gave, I mean, we've talked, talked before on this podcast around getting that right balance between legal, uh, regulatory, ethical behaviours across different geographies, different markets, different expectations, if you like. Would people kind of yeah. be comfortable with that model? Well, if we went um, if we went back to the, the salary setting example, we don't use AI to set salaries. If I could if I could predict whether you were going to say whether somebody's salary goes up or down, then I don't need you anymore. I could use AI to to, to set salaries. But the fact is, is you need to augment human decision making with with AI uh, for for many uh, different um, uh, problems, and so I, I don't see this going away in in the short term. Um, so so I think understanding how to bring these two um, uh, things together, people and uh, and technology, I think is going to be an, an interesting challenge to solve. I, I think there's another type of augmentation that we need to face into, which is many organisations want to have diverse experts to help make decisions, whether that's using AI or not, but they don't have the, uh, I don't know, they're not sexy enough or they're not interesting enough to attract that talent. So how could they tap into yes. um, uh, expertise outside the organization to help them make um, better decisions? So there, there's, there are three parts you have to, to deal with. One is your internal stakeholders. There, there, is a, there is a body of experts externally, um, historians and philosophers and whatnot that you could bring in. To, and, then, and then there's AI as well that you can, that you can use to help bring in these three, three things together. And, and how do I mean, one of the things that I'm interested there is how we actually connect those communities, because they're not necessarily connected communities today. They, 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 there are, I mean, as you said earlier, there is the tech industry that is very focused around what it does around AI ethics as it is at the moment. But one of the things that I find, there are exceptions, but a lot of that is in country. Um, so there are some initiatives that, that span regions or, or, or world. But how do we effectively identify and bring those communities together in such a way that each can learn off what each other is finding? Because I think on a weekly basis, I find a new community, not, not just an individual, but a new community that is doing broadly similar things to an existing community that is doing broadly similar things to another existing community. How do we better inform between those groups? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like you, I'm seeing a, a huge number of um, companies or offerings cropping up to provide these services. Um, wherever I see a friction or wherever I see uh, an inefficiency or ineffective process, I, uh, I think, well, maybe we could utilize technology to solve that. So, you know, you could potentially use AI to identify those people, to bring those people together. Um, I don't want to kind of use these technologies as a panacea to solve all of our problems, but where there is a friction, typically we can use AI to alleviate. Now, of course, then that AI is subject to bias and, and on all sorts of stuff. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. There's a huge number of communities out there of, of a wealth of knowledge and experience that we need to be able to get visibility to, to, uh, to uh, and AI could help help facilitate that. Cool. Um, so um, I, I remember the first time we ever spoke, uh, you, you were talking at that, that stage about that point around uh, the way people's salaries were 
judged, if you like, or set within your business, which at the time I remember being fascinated by uh, and, and fascinated in the context of that being such a change to the organisational norms, just, just how it would sustain. One of the things that I'm increasingly conscious of is maybe we do need new operating models, an evolution of the way that businesses do conduct themselves. Is there anything that you're seeing maybe building on your experience of the last few years, pushing some of those boundaries? And again, thinking about how technology can empower and enable things to be done or by in a kind of transparent, explainable way. What else are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the word, um, uh, 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 so we, uh, what blockchain, um, and what blockchain enables, potentially enables, is a, is a concept called decentralized autonomous organizations. And essentially, you don't have a centralized company, but you can bring different skills together using technology, using platforms to be able to solve a particular problem and then, and then disperse. And there are some industries that already do this. The film industry bring different organizations together to produce a film and then they all disperse. And, uh, and, and I think that there's a future where blockchain and AI could be used to frictionlessly um, identify people, um, whether their skills are captured on a blockchain or whatever, to be able to then facilitate them, to bring them together, to solve a problem, to build an innovation, whatever, and then and then and then go on their way and be fairly remunerated for that contribution. So actually, my my passion over the next thirty years will be to try to create an operating model, not just for a company, but I want to create an operating model for a planet. I'm interested in figuring out how we could tap into the global community of people to frictionlessly solve many of the problems that I think we're going to be facing in humanity over the next several decades. I, I want to tap into the creative capacity of, of humanity um, using blockchain, using AI to uh, empower those people to solve problems. And, um, and yeah, I do think that's a possible future. And, and in theory, if you can remove the friction from the creation of goods, from, the, from services, you can then bring the cost down and if you can bring the cost down, it means you could potentially also create a world of abundance. So I know there's a lot of negativity and 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 uh, and scaremongering around around AI, and I think that that we should face into some of that. But I also think we could use these technologies to create a, a really glorious future for ourselves. I'm I'm smiling because I had a similar conversation a couple of weeks ago, and I was reminded of a, um, a a presentation I put together in 2012 using Prezi. If for those of us that remember Prezi. And it's still out there, actually, I checked. Uh, and I called it extreme innovation. And it was just that point about disaggregating problem statements such that you can get anyone in the world who can could fix that discrete kind of part of it and then putting it back together. Uh, and, and of course, this was kind of put before um, blockchain, et cetera. But there are challenges that that brings in terms of what everyone then does, because a, 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 everything that you describe, yes, kind of is feasible, but there'll be a resistance to change because a lot of people that that will be alien to in terms of a way of operating. And the other aspect and, and, and within the CDR space is, is the inclusion and accessibility of that. So how do you ensure that those people who may have the know-how to be able to address or fix something, but don't know, don't have the mechanistic kind of knowledge of the technologies that enable them to um, play in that ecosystem how, how do you how do you get them involved how, how do you actually ensure that it is the planet operating with with equal opportunity for all as opposed to just those who can make sense of the mechanism yeah so we're seeing platforms appear uh, over the past decade like the uberization of things the, the gig economy where you have people building this stuff but then you have the actors that are playing a part in that and the example i often use is uh, i don't think that i'll be able to think about all the creative solutions to tap into those that community but for example you might have people in old people's homes that are sitting there bored and you might have people in a country that are wanting to learn English and could you boot up a platform that you could rapidly rapidly build and then connect these two communities now what you're doing is you you're giving these old people a, a meaning meaningful work or a way of contributing and, and and I think that if we can tap into the global community if we can enable those people to create innovations I think that they will work out how we can utilize more and more people and give people meaning in in, in their lives and, and I think 
I mean, it's a hell of an ambitious kind of conversation, isn't it? In the sense that uh, in in the last kind of 15 minutes, we've we've built a global platform that enables everyone to kind of innovate in ways that we've never seen before um, and corporate businesses to have an AI kind of driven uh, ethical advisor. For, and, and both are probably absolutely necessary, but they don't just happen overnight. So, so I guess the question would be, where do we start? If we want to make a difference in 2021, conscious that actually some of these issues are about now, are about today. What, what can we do this year to make a difference? How do we move our organisation forward? I think there are a couple of things, actually. So one is uh, we need to hold stakeholders accountable to having a purpose and not just a profit motive. And, and I think that the companies that have a strong purpose um, are the ones that are going to attract talent and they're the ones that are going to attract talent. So we need, sorry, to attract, attract talent and attract customers. So I think we need to hold our leadership, our stakeholders accountable for, for a profit, a purpose motive and not just a, a, a profit, um, a profit motive. And the, the, the second, um, uh, the second thing that we can do is be much more conscientious about what we consume. So, so the, this, this, this working in organizations and ensuring that they have a, 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 um, a purpose motive, but also being conscientious about the, 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 the technologies we assume uh, we, we consume, the food, the goods that we consume, because in some respects we're, at, we're, we're voting with our, with our, with our feet um, in, in terms of, um, in terms of what we consume. So that's, that's one way that we can do this. That's the one thing that we can do this year to hold those, uh, those uh, uh, organizations accountable. And I think, and I think maybe uh, if there is anything remotely good to come out of the pandemic at all, then maybe it is that sense of community that is driving that as a stronger thought process through many of our minds. How do we ensure that kind of we are doing things so that there is a stronger sense of community and, and fairness for all as we come out of this experience that we've all been through? Um, and what do we need? To, to, to do that look um fascinating conversation and and brilliant to have gone through um it's it, i love uh, the conversation every time we talk um any final thoughts for our listeners um before we kind of sign off i think i think it's it's in all of our hands to make this a, a positive future the decisions that we make every day about what we do um will will create these um these futures and uh, and yeah i just think everybody should feel like that they actually are empowered to do that and not just rely on governments and and executives to, to solve these problems we, we can solve them by doing good making good decisions every single day 